There are a ton of very powerful and iconic weapons in the Warcraft universe, but only a few of them are available to players. So in this video, I wanted to run through 10 of those weapons that players can transmog so they can head into battle with one of those iconic weapons themselves. Now, I'm not going to be including any artifact weapons in this list as that feels like a little bit of a cheat because the video could just be finished with 10 artifact weapons. So every item in this game will not be an artifact weapon for that reason. At number 10, we have the Hammer of the Naru, and this is a weapon you've probably seen a ton within World of Warcraft. It is the weapon wielded by Marad at first, and it's the weapon that you see in the Burning Crusade trailer. In the Warlords of Draenor expansion, Marad does unfortunately meet defeat, but then the weapon is picked up and used by Yorel, another very iconic Draenor champion. Now, the Hammer of the Naru does share its weapon skin with a few other weapons, but the actual Hammer of the Naru is only obtainable from killing High King Mulgar in Gruul's Lair. So if you want the proper Hammer of the Naru, then that's where you're going to have to go to get it. And this is a two-handed mace that is still available in the game. At number nine, we have the Blade Fist. And this is a fist weapon with a fairly large blade on it. So it fits the name Blade Fist quite well. And this weapon actually has a bit of a grim past to it. It's the weapon of Kargath Blade Fist, who was a slave and ended up cutting off his own arm to escape captivity. So where his arm used to be, he then replaced it with the Blade Fist and went on to be the leader of the Fell Horde in Burning Crusade and was also the chieftain of the Shattered Hand Clan. Now this weapon actually has two versions of it as well, but these versions are very different unlike the Hammer of Naru. First of all, you have the original Blade Fist, which you can get from the Burning Crusade Dungeon Shattered Halls. The last boss in there will actually be Kargath Blade Fist. You'll defeat him and you'll have a chance of getting the Blade Fist. There is also a newer version of the Blade Fist. Once again, when we went to Warlords of Draenor, you had to defeat Kargath Blade Fist in High Mole, and he will drop the new and updated Blade Fist. At number eight, we have the Arcanite Reaper. And while this weapon doesn't have strong lore ties, it is still pretty well known within the WoW player base. And that's for a few reasons. Extremely strong weapon for warriors in classic WoW. So it is something the warriors did look to get because it was pretty good. And it is also the current heirloom weapon as well. So, you know, we've seen it quite a lot in the game. But it also became quite popular as well from a machinima. Back in the old days where machinimas were quite popular in the WoW scene, there was one in particular that used the Arcanite Reaper, and there was a particular scene. that pretty much catapulted the weapon's popularity. So for that reason, the Arcanite Reaper does take the ape spot. Now in terms of getting this weapon, you have a couple of options. First of all, you could go after the original Arcanite Reaper, which you'd have to find someone who has the recipe, or you might find one on the auction house as well, because it is BOE, so you will get some people selling it. The other alternative is it's actually been made into an heirloom weapon, so you can go and get the heirloom weapon and transmog that as well. Finally, there is the also the Spinal Reaper, which has a different hilt, but it is essentially the same model, just slightly different in color. But you can get that from Ragnaros, the old Molten Core Ragnaros, if you're after that version instead. At number seven, we have the twin blades Quel Sarah and Quel Della. And these blades were forged by the five Dragonflights with the help of the Night Elves. And once they were actually created, they went separate ways. The twin blades were separated and the Quel Sarah ended up being gifted to the Kaldorai while the Queldella was gifted to the Queldorai. After being forged, these blades served in multiple different battles, defeating trolls and undead, and then eventually becoming available to the players. The original Quell Sarah coming from a quest line that started from Diamol on a very low drop chance, you'd have to go through that quest chain, you'd have to go and defeat Anixia, and eventually you would be awarded with the Quell Sarah, so quite a rare and iconic weapon from Vanilla WoW. That quest chain was removed so you can no longer get the original Quell Sarah, but the weapons were brought back in Wrath of the Lich King when Anixia's lair was revamped as a level 80 raid, and there you could get the Burnished Quell Sarah and also the Gleaming Quell Sarah. In terms of obtaining the Quell Della, you had to get the Battered Hilt, which was an item added in the Fall of the Lich King dungeons. And you'd do the dungeons, you'd have a chance of getting this item drop. And that would take you on a quest chain where it was quite a cool and lore heavy quest chain. And at the end of it, you would kind of reforge the Quell Della and be able to wield it. Or if unfortunately you were a class that couldn't wield the Quell Della, you were given a substitute weapon that wasn't the Quell Della and it would be handed off to a, a suitable champion. 
But if you were a class that could wield it, like a paladin or a warrior, etc., then you were rewarded with a version of the Queldala, and you were able to use that. At number six, we have the Sword of a Thousand Truths, a sword with a large prophecy behind it, which was foretold by Salzman the Wise. This is another sword that doesn't have a deep tie to Warcraft lore, but it is extremely known within the WoW playbase, and that's because it made an appearance on the South Park episode Make Love Not Warcraft. And it was a sword that was used to defeat Jenkins, which was kind of like the big villain of the episode, a big villain within World of Warcraft. It was an enemy player that was basically unstoppable, and they had to use this sword to be able to beat him. The Sword of a Thousand Truths doesn't actually exist as the Sword of a Thousand Truths in World of Warcraft though, but it does have two items that look identical. The first being the Hungering Cold, which dropped from Kelfazad in the old Naxxramas in Classic WoW. That is no longer available. But the weapon was brought back as the Slayer of the Lifeless, which also does have a reference to the South Park episode on it. And you can get that from Gothic the Harvester in Ten Man Naxxramas. At number five, we have Tashalak, and that is the weapon wielded by the Titan Agrimar. And the weapon just looks fantastic for starters, but it also has a bit more of lore to it. Unfortunately, that lore is essentially non canon anymore, but when it was canon, it was pretty cool so I thought it deserved fifth on this list. So the original story behind Tishalak is that it's actually a fragment of a more powerful weapon, one of the most powerful weapons known in the game, and that is Gorshalak. We do see a little hint towards Gorshalak from the trinket that drops from Agrimar, but Tishalak was a fragment of Gorshalak, and Gorshalak was originally the weapon wielded by Sargeras. This weapon was his weapon until he betrayed the Pantheon, and then it split itself into two pieces. It became Gorobal and Tishalak, and it was said that if the two pieces were brought together and wielded by someone who was Werther, then the Gorshalak weapon could be reborn again, and once again be one of the most powerful weapons known in the game. Now, as I said, it does seem like that lore has been cut, but it is still really cool and the weapon looks cool, so I thought that was enough for it to deserve the fifth spot on this list. To obtain Tershalak for yourself, then you'll need to go and kill Agrima in Antorus and be extremely lucky because this weapon is on an extremely low drop chance. It's basically a rare item, mainly just for transmog, so you do have to be very lucky to get it, but when you do get it, damn it's going to be worth it. At number four, we have Gorhowl, and this is a weapon that has seen a lot of action and has quite deep lore ties within the game. It was seen in Warcraft, it was seen in World of Warcraft, and it was the weapon wielded by Gromash Hellscream, but before him, it was actually wielded by multiple other generations of Hellscreams as well, so it's seen a lot of action in its time. It was used to defeat a lot of enemies, but a few more notable ones was it was used to defeat Cenarius, it was used to defeat Manoroth twice, the first time to free the orcs, and then the second time in Warlord to drain off from, you know, to prevent the orcs from being taken over. And after Gramash's defeat, the axe does eventually end up with Garrosh, who uses it for a while, but then eventually falls to madness and abandons the axe in Siege of Orgrimmar. We're not too sure what happened to the axe after that. It's not really been mentioned. There is an alternative version of the axe in Warlord to Draenor, but that isn't the same one that we know that was abandoned in Siege of Orgrimmar. Now, this weapon is obtainable, but not really from where you would expect. It comes from Karazhan, the last boss in there, Prince Malkazar, and it'll be a drop from him, but there's not really any reason, not really any strong lore ties to why it drops from that boss, so it's just kind of been given to that boss for no particular reason, because at that time it should have still been in the possession of Thrall. But we can obtain it, so if you want a weapon with pretty deep lore ties, then Gorhal is definitely one to go after. Down to the final three now, and at number three we have Sulfurus the Hand of Ragnaros, but also Sulfurus the Extinguished Hand, because unfortunately Sulfurus the Hand of Ragnaros is a legendary weapon that we can't transmog, but Sulfurus the Extinguished Hand is you know, kind of the same thing, just a better version. And Ragnaros is a pretty damn iconic boss in the game. I mean, he's been around since ancient times, he battled the old gods, failed but still tried and was enslaved by them, he battled the titans, he fought against us in Molten Core and we were able to defeat him. So when you think of a boss from Classic WoW, the one that stands out to you the most is probably going to be Ragnaros. I mean, even Blizzard for their 15th anniversary for World of Warcraft are making a Ragnaros statue, so it shows the boss is pretty damn important. 
He also returns in Cataclysm and joins Deathwing, tries to bring about the Hour of Twilight, and then we actually go and defeat him in his Elemental Plane, which is pretty much the, should be at least, the permanent end for Ragnaros. But that doesn't stop him from potentially being summoned back again, and there are attempts to make that happen. So Ragnaros is definitely a big, big bad guy, and having his weapon, you know, is just pretty damn cool. So that is why the Sulfurus, the Hand of Ragnaros, and Sulfurus, the Extinguished Hand, made it to number three. Now, Sulfurus, the Hand of Ragnaros, is obtainable, and you can kind of get the non-glowy version if you want, which comes from classic blacksmith crafting, or you can get the legendary version, which requires you to get the eye from Ragnaros in Molten Core, but that is a legendary item, so we cannot transmog it. Or alternatively, you can do the Firelands Ragnaros, and you'll have a chance of getting the Sulfurus, the Extinguished Hand Drop, which is basically an updated model of the weapon, and is wieldable by two handers, so it's quite a low drop chance, but once again, really, really cool weapon. At number two now, and are you prepared for the War Glaives of Azanoff? These are weapons wielded by Illidan, weapons that he obtained over 10,000 years ago from a Doom Guard called Azanoff, and... Illidim himself is pretty iconic in the game, I mean he's been a villain, he's been a good guy, he's been kind of a bad good guy, he's just been around for quite a while, and is obviously the main villain of the Burning Crusade expansion, I mean the trailer alone is amazing. So Illidan definitely up there as someone we, we all know from out multiple periods of the game, I mean he was in Warcraft, he was in World of Warcraft multiple times now, and he's currently in space. As mentioned before, Illidan obtained the blades from Azanoff, which was a Doom Guard, and originally actually the glaive was a four-bladed weapon that Illidan could split apart and split into the two war glaives, and he trained himself how to wield these, how to get the most use out of them, and then from there he made those blades see a lot of demon blood. He used them to defeat Magtheridon and a bunch of other demons throughout his wake, but not only that, he used them multiple times in various other battles, for example, his battle against Arthas. So, you know, the Warglades of Azarf are definitely up there as a weapon that we all know of in the game, and it's one that we all wish we could use. Unfortunately, most people can't actually use the Warglades of Azanoth, but Demon Hunters, on the other hand, are a little bit more lucky, and they can, because these are legendary weapons, but Demon Hunters can actually transmog them. If you have the achievement where you've gotten the left and right Warglaive of Azanoth, and then as a Demon Hunter, if you defeat Illidan in the Time Walking version of Black Temple, which is available when the Burning Crusade Time Walking event is around, you can go in there with a rage, you can kill Illidan, and if you have the achievement for having both of the Warglaives and you defeat Illidan as a Demon Hunter, you will actually get the transmogable appearance of the Warglaives of Azanoth. So Demon Hunter is currently the only class in the game that is able to transmog it. It isn't an artifact skin, it's purely just a transmogable appearance. So if you're a demon hunter and you want to wield some really cool weapons, then we'll start farming for the blades and wait for the Burning Crusade time walking to come back around. And finally, at number one, we have the original Corrupted Ashbring. Not the artifact one, but the one that was available in Vanilla WoW. And even today, if you see someone with this weapon, especially today, you just kind of have to stop, you have to inspect them and be like, damn, that guy is really cool. So this is a weapon with pretty deep lore ties. The blade was forged by Magni and Magni forged it with the intent of it being used as kind of a weapon of vengeance and retribution because he wanted vengeance for Muradin, who he believed had fallen to the Scourge at the time. And the weapon got its name because it basically left nothing in its path. It defeated the Scourge and would leave nothing but Ash, which was why it was the Ashbringer. From there, it was wielded by Alexandros Morgrain, who became the first Ashbringer, and he was eventually assassinated by his son, Renault, and once he was assassinated, the weapon fell to corruption and became the corrupted Ashbringer. From there, players were able to obtain it from Naxxramas, defeating the four horsemen, and you would have a chance of obtaining the corrupted Ashbringer. Once you had the Corrupted Ashbringer in Vanilla WoW, you could actually take it to Scarlet Monastery, and there you would see a unique event play out where Renault would basically be faced with retribution for what he did to his father. Later on in Wrath of the Lich King, Darian Morgrain, Alexandros' other son, wields the blade but in the name of the Lich King because he's being controlled by the Lich King at the time, and he's basically sent to his death to fight Tyrion. Tyrion sees what is going on and 
brings Darien Morgrain to his senses essentially and also purifies the blade and Tyrion becomes the new Ashbringer, restoring the Ashbringer back to its original self. Later in Legion, Tyrion does unfortunately fall to the Legion and then the player character ends up becoming the new Ashbringer, but you don't get the original Ashbringer or the original Corrupted Ashbringer in any way, you get an artifact weapon from there out. So the original Corrupted Ashbringer is no longer available to players, the only ones who are able to transmog it are those who had it from Vanilla WoW, those are the only people that kind of have the honour and the privilege of showing off their Corrupted Ashbringer, and honestly they deserve it, they probably get a crap ton of whispers, crap ton of people being like, oh my god dude you have Corrupted Ashbringer, Ringer, and it's pretty well deserved because it's one of the more iconic and cool weapons in the game. So that does bring us to the end of this list and hopefully this was a little bit of fun for you. I tried to throw in you know, a little bit of lore, like give you an idea of what the weapons were about and also show you where to get them if they are still obtainable. Either way though, thanks for watching until the end. Look out for more videos coming soon. See ya!